Okay. All right, everyone. As you can see, I'm about to do the director's commentary for Mexico, the 10 days I spent in Mexico. Uh, now, this particular commentary is going to look a little weird because I look like this right now, and it's in the evening here. Uh, however, I'd already recorded this, and you, this camera right here, uh, went all fuzzy on me, and um, I just didn't see that it, it, had, uh, it had gone to focus. It, was fo it wasn't focusing on me. I was blurry, so now I have to redo it all. So I'm redoing about the first 22 minutes of this for you, and then we're just gonna, it's gonna slip in and all of a sudden I'm gonna look different. But the stories are the same and uh, the background is cool, so we're just gonna get right into this. I actually have the notes of what I talked about that first time around that uh, got all blurry and we can't use it, so away we go. Uh, and I never say this, but I should. Hit the like button if you like it. Uh, and please subscribe if you aren't subscribed. We're trying to get me up to a million, and when, when we get to a million, I will deliver you a brand new, classic Survivor Man episode. So, gotta get me to a million, folks. Uh, in the meantime, where's my remote? Here we go. Uh, shall we just get into this? I'm gonna press play. ba -da. I think I see what the seagulls were all on about. That is what I think it is. Fortune may have just delivered me a meal. That's gonna be good. Or it's gonna make me violently sick. And I'm gonna stop right there on that guy doing his ah. Um, a couple things here. Uh, some, I went back and I sort of checked out the credits. I have to sometimes go in and, and look up the credits to figure out, okay, what was going on in my life at that time? And who was there and who was I working with? And I can often tell by the executive producers from Discovery or Science Channel what was going on. In this case, um, Josh Berkeley was my EP. There's a bunch of names at the end and I'm not gonna name them here. I did the first go around before it was blurry and I had to, I'm replacing it as I am right now. I mentioned some names. Basically, they were, they were people who got their credits listed who had nothing to do with the show. I didn't even meet some of them. But that's, you know, thus is the business. That's the way you have to do it. You have to include their names like, you know, for Discovery Channel or for National Geographic or for History Channel. You see all these names at the end. Maybe two of them had something to do with the series and the rest of them, they just get these courtesy credits. It's really kind of ridiculous. And it's ridiculous because years later, you might be at a, having a cocktail talking to one of these people. Oh, yeah, I was, uh, I was responsible for the, uh, the Survivor Man series at, uh, you know, the Science Channel. And it's like someone I never even met but they got a courtesy credit. But Josh Berkeley definitely deserved his credit. He was one of the cool guys. And one more word on that. In 14 years of filming uh, and, uh, for Discovery Channel, for Science Channel, I went through, now it was longer than that. I, I, I actually uh, delivered the Survivor Man series for uh, more than 18 years. But there was a span where I was keeping track of 14 years. In that time, I had 11 new executive producers working with me, 11. Now do the math on how long their careers were. It wasn't like they were climbing the ladder. Now some of them were. Most of them were ushered out the door. So yeah, it, it was always funny to me. Sometimes I'd meet somebody new and I, and I kinda wanna say, you know, you might wanna get your resume out there now because I'm only gonna know you for 12 to 18 months. And that's, that's the truth. 11 executive producers in 14 months. Some of them were great, some of them were atrocious. Uh, and at some point I'll talk to you about network notes. I might have already mentioned it before. So little teaser there. At some point I'll talk about network notes and what happens when executives send you notes on what you're, what you're filming. Uh, but in this case, Josh Berkeley was my guy. He was great. He was sensible. Loved working with him. Very similar to Charlie Parsons who had been there earlier. Um, and uh, so, but the thing that I wanted to get to and why I'm checking the credits and why I'm looking is, is, is where was I at during this? This is the one time I want to say it's not that I phoned it in, but I was not in a good headspace. I was, I think, probably two years into, um, or maybe a year and a half into having split with my wife, and so things were kind of dark in a lot of senses, you know, and, and, and it, was a, it was a struggle, uh, mentally and emotionally, to just go out and film more Survivor Man, and this was, and also at the very same time, you know, by now, Man vs. Wild and Dual Survival and all the copycat shows had come along, so I was feeling that, you know, that, that sort of bitterness in a way uh, in dealing with the network. So all of this was on my shoulders and I, I, I was just like, ah oh, man, 
all right, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do 10 day episodes. Well, the key to the 10 days wasn't so much that it was cool to say 10 days, but it's that I could actually get two episodes out of one location. So it was film production expediency in, in, in a way, because I go five days here and five days there. In the case of Mexico, five days on the edge of the ocean, five days in the interior gives me two episodes. So it was a great way to get two episodes out of traveling to one location, taking a crew and all that sort of stuff. And yes, of course, as you know, I had no crew with me while I was doing my thing, but the crew that would be getting the beauty shots or my location fixers, what have you. So that's the lead into this. I'm going to have to check my notes, make sure I don't miss something. And uh, yeah, I guess the other thing that I had mentioned earlier was this is actually before I shot uh, Surviving Man Bigfoot, before I shot Beyond Survival. I think Beyond Survival came out of some discussions uh, of, uh, around this time uh, that that's something I wanted to do. If you haven't seen the Beyond Survival series, you really should check it out. Uh, it's here on this channel. Uh, go to the playlist, go to Beyond Survival, and watch them there. I am now working on a massive re-edit. Uh, they also are on PBS in the United States, but I'm working on a massive re-edit because we shot so much of the ceremonies, these spiritual ceremonies with these indigenous cultures, and I was not allowed to keep them in the episodes of Beyond Survival. More on that later when I do the director's commentaries on that series. But, uh, so this was before that, uh, and yeah, I guess that's it. That's all I gotta say about that. So that was before that. Uh, in fact, you know what? Luke, go ahead and show the uh, Beyond Survival sizzle reel so we can see what we're talking about here. Go ahead. This is the skeleton of a Haywa man, a father. I'm here with his son. And today we performed a come out in ceremony and brought the bones out of the ground. Touching bodies, decomposing, cause a lot of disease. So I'm going to show what will happen when we get down further. Pretty cool, right? So that was a, I love that series so very much. And so now I'm working on all the, the content, the material that we shot that, never, that has never been seen uh, when it comes to the, the ancient ceremonies that I did. All right, so we want to get into this. Uh, oh, by the way, reminder, some of you are like, oh man, why does the guy keep talking? Well, clearly you've been under a rock. This is a director's commentary. I'm here to comment. I'm here, I'm hanging with you. I'm drinking a nice glass of Stag's Leap, Artemis, cheers. And I earned that glass of wine. Went for a good run today with the dogs. Uh, so, you know what? I'm going to shut up. Let's just get into it. Oh, that's right. I wanted to talk about this opening. Let's watch this opening. Here we go. No, let's not watch it. Stop. Let's, go to, let's do this. Luke, play the original classic opening from Survivor Man. I want everybody to hear that first before we listen to this one. Go ahead. Okay, so Cool, right? That The idea behind when I wrote that, so that was all me. I did that in my basement. The bass guitar riff is me. Uh, you know the, the call? Ah, ah, ah. That was actually just an Apple loop. 
But everything else was me playing it uh, in, my, in my basement, uh, recording it. When I recorded the Survivor Man theme song, what I was going for was a memorable theme, something that got you, when you'd be in the kitchen and go, hey, Survivor Man's on, and you'd run to the living room to watch it. That is what I was going for, and I do believe that I achieved it, because many people have told me that. But I was, I was simply emulating what I grew up with. You know, when I would be a kid, and I would hear, dun da 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 I knew Get Smart was on. You know, or, this is it, light the lights, Bugs Bunny, exactly. So those themes, uh, were, were a big part of my, my childhood growing up, a big part of my memory, my psyche, and I wanted that to happen with Survivor Man. So I wrote, wrote it in a way that I thought, oh, you'd know the show's coming on. So for the longest time, we had it as a classic sense, what you've just heard. But now, along, uh, getting further along here, I thought, let's update it. Keep the same theme, keep the same musical motif, but working with Brian Potvin from the Northern Pikes in Canada and Ian Oje, we got together in the studio and we updated this thing. And I said, let's do it a little more kick-ass. Let me bring in my harmonica, wail a little bit, and, but keep everything else sort of the same. And so we came up with this. Pretty cool, eh? Oh, hang on, you can't see me. Let's go brighter. There, that's brighter. Now you can see me. Uh, pretty cool, right? Uh, I, I love doing that with Brian and Ian, and it just, it's like it breathed a bit of new life uh, in, into me watching the show myself. One more thing I wanna say is, did I say it already? If you wanna watch this uninterrupted, go to the playlist, watch Survivor Man, this episode, Mexico 10 Days, uninterrupted. I won't bug you with that one. You can just watch it all the way through. Actually, it's kind of good to watch this director's commentary and then go watch the episode. All right, so where are we here? Let's play. This is Tiburon Island, situated off the sunny and warm coast of Mexico. But this is no tropical paradise with coconuts to enjoy. It's a rugged and unforgiving landscape that is the original homeland of the Siri Indians. Any bounty that exists here to help with survival is hidden under the waters of the estuaries and in the rocky crags of the desert mountains themselves. While the ocean can be bountiful, it's unpredictable, and your skills need to be strong. What it doesn't offer is fresh water. For that, I'll likely have to trek through the scorching desert inland, because without water, survival is just not possible. Happens every year. People sail, people get lost. Or they run into trouble, usually it's the result of weather and bad weather. And if you're lucky... Let's just stop it right there and take a look at that boat. So a word on, you know, the different vehicles and, and, and modes of transportation that I've used while filming Survivor Man. The idea, as you know, if you've been watching these director's commentaries, has always been to... You know what? I'm not sure which camera. I'm looking at this camera because it's closer. Maybe I should be looking at that camera. I don't know. Luke's going to figure out. We're going to go from this one, then we're going to go that one, then we're going to come back. Never mind. This is me messing around with Luke here. So, okay, where was I? I need to drink more wine. That's what I need to do. Uh, vehicles. This boat. When it comes to laying out the Survivor Man scenarios, uh, it was always a matter of, okay, what realistically could go wrong? Um, what could happen? For example, I always wanted to do broken down in a car in the snow, and that's how we ended up doing the Norway 10 days one. It was based off that first. Like, can we get up into the snow with this car, and can I damage it? Can I do, you know, things to it? There's the snowmobile in the Arctic. There's the ATV with uh, Bushman Bob when I did that one. There's the plane in season one. There's this boat. The thing is that... Uh, it needs to be something I can trash, something I can break up, something I can bust up. And with the, I think, you know, I was definitely able to do whatever I wanted with the plane uh, up in, uh, in Tomogamy on that season one episode. I think I told the story then. That plane was actually 
helicoptered in and placed in its position and then helicoptered so that I could get in and do my survival thing. So I have to go to all of this effort to try to tell this story. And then sometimes, see, I have to, I mean, I'm leaving the vehicle. I got to fly home in a week anyway. I'm to bring the, 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 the footage home and start editing. So someone has to be in charge of going in and extracting that junked out vehicle. I remember the Jeep that I used in the Kalahari. I wasn't allowed to do much to it or anything to it. Um, I also discovered along the way a great survival uh, myth, I suppose. And that is that we can simply just tear apart uh, our vehicles for making some kind of survival implement. It's not true. Most of the things on these big vehicles, including a sailboat, they're bolted on. And unless you have tools, you're not ripping anything off. You're pulling off a bit of vinyl from the seats and some rubber and some wires. That's the best you can do. So it's not like you can turn your broken down car into a huge survival shelter or some sort of great thing to get you out of there. It's, it's, that's, that's Hollywood. That's not real. In this case, it was a sailboat. And uh, I think it took them a while to go in and get, I think the sailboat ended up getting sloshed with water and it was really tough for them to get the sailboat out of the, there after I was finished. But they did finally do it. Uh, but it always makes me nervous. Like, did they go in? Did they get the boat out? I don't want it left there being junked out. And um, uh, I know with the, in the case of the, in the car in Norway, it sat up there for a year before someone went in to get it. So I was a little ticked about that. But let's keep watching. Find yourself either close to port, close to safety, or a way to get to an island that's got sustenance for survival. Coconuts, fresh water, whatever you need. If you're not lucky, end up like me. My mast is busted, my kicker motor's out of gas, and I am off the coast of an island, so that's good. It just so happens to be a desert island, Tiburon Island, Mexico, also known as Shark Island. That's gonna be a long 10 days. As the safety team leaves, I've been left aboard a disabled sailboat. So let's stop it right there. As the safety, safety team leads, leaves, can't even speak. As the safety team leaves, that was always important for me to get across to say to you so that you're aware, okay, this is why we have these beautiful aerial shots. This is why we have this sort of hero type shots and these opening scenes and everything. It was always really difficult for me to shoot my opening scenes uh, of Survivor Man because I, I had a specific thing I wanted to say. I wanted to get across. And so a lot of times um, we would just do them with, you know, Max or whoever was there filming. Uh, then I would run through everything, they'd get the shots, and then they would leave. And it also gave me an opportunity to say, and the crew is leaving, which reminds you, the viewer, oh yeah, the dude's alone. For the next 10 days, I'll have to eke out a survival-based existence by whatever means I can find. The nights are cold enough to chill you to the bone, and if you're foolish, make you hypothermic. And the days are hot enough to dehydrate you quickly, which is a bad combination for basic survival. But out here, survival always depends on my ingenuity and my drive to discover every opportunity I can to make things better. And there are small advantages to every location if you pay attention and open your eyes to the possibilities. For now, I'm anchored on the windward side at about 100 feet off of a long spit of land that cradles an estuary on the lee side. Let me just stop that right there. So, aerial shots. Uh, very. Interesting situation with this. So for a lot of years, uh, if I wanted to get aerial shots done, I had to hire a helicopter. And boy, those, that was expensive. You'd be fifteen dollars to $25,000 just for the helicopter. And even then, you'd only get them for a half a day, maybe three hours, sometimes an hour. Uh, and you'd have to hope they were okay with putting GoPros on the underneath bottom of the helicopter. So, and that's when GoPros were just being invented. Actually, this shoot, this shoot and I'll say this later, um, I'm pretty sure I talk about it later, that, that uh, this is the first time I was using GoPros. So that's how early uh, it is. This is the very first GoPro. So putting cameras on the outside of helicopters, it wasn't even that for a long time. It was bigger cameras. So you had to get permission for that. So that was always expensive and fun. I mean, I love doing it, but uh, drones happened. Now, back at this time, you have to understand, nobody had drones. The only people that had drones were a couple of real nerdy people, some nerdy people who were into flying drones, right? There was like flying clubs and things like that, but they were just, they were just like a fun hobby, like trains. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it went to this next room. It was like, we can put cameras on these things. So what happened first was you had a handful of, of 
drone nerds that would create a company and they weren't cheap either. They were 3,500 bucks a day. Plus you had to fly them where you're going and keep them up and all that. So, so it was still cheaper than using a helicopter. But uh, they had their heyday, I want to say, for about a year and a half, two years, maybe three years even, where you hire, hired a drone team, right? And it was a big deal. Uh, and then all of a sudden, drones became ubiquitous. And as you know now, everybody's got a drone. Little kids have drones. You get them for Christmas. It's not a big deal. And they have great cameras, even way better cameras on them now. But at, back in the day, as they say, uh, you had to hire these, these teams to come out and get shots. But I will say, and, and you guys know, that, sure, it's a bit of braggadocio, but I'm always very proud when either my editing team, like Barry Farrell and the, that, that gang, or myself, do something that nobody else was doing. Well, at this time, you didn't see drone shots yet. They were, nobody was, it wasn't happening for regular television shows, maybe a blue chip documentary. And a blue chip documentary is a very expensive, high-end wildlife stuff. We started using drones right away before you saw it anywhere else on all the reality shows. And now, of course, as I said, then it just, it became ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And, and in fact, ad nauseum at this point, there's so many drone shots in everything that people do. Word of advice, if you're gonna use drone shots, shots for, your, for your film production, then Make it a motivated shot. There needs to be a reason for that shot, not just let's get some high and beautiful, high and beautiful, high and beautiful. With Wild Harvest, my TV series Wild Harvest, which you guys should be watching, you can see it on, uh, the, uh, on the playlist here right on this channel, um, I'm always pushing whoever's operating the drone, and sometimes it's me saying, let's get something cool. Don't just go up high. Let's do something really funky. Where, can we have the drone inside? Let's m maneuver it around. Far more creatively interesting to watch that than just the same old, what I call, High and beautiful. Uh, how's the drone shots? High and beautiful, high and beautiful, high and beautiful. Uh-uh. Get something funky with them. All right, that's my drone rant, and let's keep watching. You know what I think I'm going to do? While you watch, I'm going to go over there and flick another light on just so it's a little bit brighter in here for, for you guys to see me. There's no doubt I'll need to eventually get on land to see what I can find, but I'll stay on board the boat to see what I have to work with here, which this time includes a kayak left in the hull of the sailboat. Well, at least I have a huge advantage this time. Kayak, that'll make a big difference. I can get back and forth from the shore with ease. Waters here are fine. I mean, it's called Tiburon Island because of the uh, large population of hammerheads that come here every year. I'm not worried about that. First, I gotta check out what I've got on board. <clears throat> See what I got to work with. Everything in this boat is dirty and musty and old. And that's what they left me with to survive 10 days. Actually, this boat comes with a bit of history. It was found floating in the Sea of Cortez. It's got no name, had no passengers, had not much on it other than the junk that you can see right now. It came out as if it was just an afternoon of sailing. I've got a bottle of wine and some cigars, a blanket, about enough water for four or five days in this heat, four or five days at best, knife and multi-tool, that's about it. The rest will be up to this sailboat if I'm gonna make it through 10 days. Now realistically, I should have had more than that, more food. I mean, if someone's lost in their own sailboat, they don't just have a bottle of wine and a cigar and a little bit of water. They have a lot more. Uh, but, you know, if I had added too much food, then it wasn't even going to be surviving, right? So I, so I needed to stress, stress it. I mean, it, you also could have lost your food. It could have gotten washed overboard. Anything could have happened. So, so that's why I set it up this way. But I also notice here um, that I... I do mention that I had a bottle of wine. And uh, more, I know more on that later uh, because that's an important thing to remember that I say here, and I've got a bottle of wine, but you never see it again in the show. So stand by for that story. I still have a reserve of water to get me through the first couple of days, but in this heat, it'll run out fast. Food is never an early concern in a survival situation. Everyone can last longer than they think without food. But without water, perishing is only days away. No point in me sleeping inside this boat. Way too musty and dirty to breathe in there. Not much chance of rain happening. This is a desert. It's hot during the day and can be quite cold at night, right down to zero, right down to freezing. There's potential for it to hit that over these nights. I'm gonna hope that it doesn't. Definitely goes down in history as the softest shelter bed I've ever had. 
It's important to be proactive rather than letting the circumstances dictate for me what I have to deal with. So I take a moment to assess my body, what I have close at hand, and what I have in an extended area around me, and start to formulate plans for survival. Reactionary survival can be doomed to failure. I think a lot of times people come in and you can do uh, sort of bare rentals where you rent a sailboat and head off with little experience and get yourself in a lot of trouble and end up in a situation like this. It'd be a bit of a rough night, it sounds like. Hopefully everything will hold fine. Using the sail as a cover to keep the uh, dew off of me. And then I lock it all, the anchor, will stay anchored. Before I have a chance to relax and enjoy the starry night, the wind has picked up and has started to hit the boat hard, tugging violently at the anchors, holding on to the sandy bottom. All right, let's just stop it right there. Uh, I think that's it. I think I've now covered the, uh, the amount of time that uh, I blew it earlier with a fuzzy camera, um, out-of-focus camera. So, uh, Luke, kick it right back in here, and uh, we'll carry on from here. Okay, now here comes, here comes less number two. And in the meantime, I'm going to drink my wine, and I'm going to go grab another one of those Survivor Man episodes over there and start working on the next director's commentary. I'm not sure what, which one it is yet. i gotta go, I go check the chronology. But uh, all right, here comes lesson number two. Go for it. Threatening to blow me far offshore. This is crazy. It's been super windy all night. Boat's rocking, straining against the anchor, and uh, not getting much sleep at all. I just keep getting up and looking at the shore and hoping that it's still there. This is when the clock becomes a killer. I don't know what time it is and I don't want to know. Just when you think it's maybe five or six in the morning and the sun should be coming up soon. You have a watch, you check it. It's only 12.30. But in this case, I don't have a watch or anything. Any way of telling time, so all I've got right now is patience. and. Uh, a rocking boat in a strong wind. And I hope that morning comes soon. And that's key. I've often always said that, you know, when it comes to survival, I don't want to have a watch on. It is torturous to think that the sun's about to come up only to find out that it's 11.30 p.m. And that's happened to me so many times in survival shelters, survival expeditions, long before doing Survivor Man. Like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, because you're shivering. So you, what happens is you fall asleep for 20 minutes. You wake up and you think, oh, how much of the night has passed? And you realize 20 minutes has passed. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's a killer. The worst way to begin a survival ordeal is with a lack of sleep. Yet ironically, that's almost always the way. And tonight will be no different for me. The wind's picked up hard all night. If the anchor were to break free, I could be blown out of the protected area and down past the Baja Peninsula out into the Pacific Ocean. I'm gonna have to rethink things. The tide currents seem to be pretty strong. The boat just kind of whips around and it's chunk, chunk, chunk for hours on end, so. So I haven't really slept. I think what I wanna do is get off this boat. But that means transporting everything that I've got, my camera gear and the supplies I have and then whatever I wanna kind of pilfer from this boat. I know it's not much, but believe it or not, that actually works. By the way, when I, talking, when I was talking earlier alluding to, you know, my emotions not fully being there, I, I don't remember the year of this, but I know, well, it was right around the time either I was about to uh, separate from my wife or I had just separated from my wife. So emotionally, like all this stuff's going on in the background. In some ways it plays well into a survival situation because you never just show up in a survival situation at the peak of your game. Other things are going on, you know, and you can't believe you're in it. So I had that to play with uh, in my mind during all of this as well. So there, just by wiping down the deck of the, the boat, and you got to be careful because there's, there's bird poop and stuff on the boat, but able to get some water. Water's gonna become really important pretty quick. The other thing I can do, I'm only able to do it a very, very small amount at a time. Take a mouthful of seawater. <coughs> That's disgusting. You can't have too much of this stuff because it's uh, very dangerous to intake seawater. Very, very dangerous. If I take just a little mouthful a day, 
It actually puts a lot of minerals and nutrients into my body. I would only do this because of the fact that I have some fresh water with me. And so that was, that's actually, uh, if I remember correctly, the name of the gentleman was Alain Bombard. So look up the expeditions by Alain, A-L-A-I-N, Bombard. I believe I've got that name right. He, he did expeditions, I believe it was for sailing, uh, and I think he went across to France from England or so. I can't remember the journey, but it was the a big part of his uh, research was how much ocean water can you ingest without going crazy, without killing yourself. Uh, and uh, so he did some amazing experiments on that. So that's one of the elements of research I had done over the years that I thought, okay, I'll bring that into this storyline. I can talk about how you can drink some seawater, but you really have to know what you're doing and it can o only be a little bit and you really need to have fresh water as well to offset the salt water. If you just drink salt water, you're gonna kill yourself. Without fresh water, ingesting straight seawater can cause an immediate lessening of thirst. But shortly afterwards, the sensation of thirst returns even stronger. The kidneys strain in a losing battle with the sea salt and soon fail. Cells become dehydrated, affecting the brain and causing hallucinations, delirium, and eventually madness. Death is not far behind. This guy knows what he's talking about. Fishing net, uh, some ropes. This is all gonna be good stuff. I just gotta get it across to the island. There's a couple old forks, some twist ties. And there is a toolbox. That's a bonus. Hammer. So a couple of old tools here. All right, I'm gonna try and pack this stuff up and get across to the island while the weather's good and while the sea's pretty calm. Surviving with camera gear is always a pain. Getting onto land is going to open up numerous possibilities for affecting survival. You know, the truth of a survival situation is that every day, every single new day, is a brand new day of survival. It might be exciting for me to get off that boat, but I know the reality is that sun is beaming down pretty hot. So my first concern right now is shelter from the sun. You gotta move slow and methodical in heat like this and in any survival situation. Don't wanna make things worse. Step one, survival on a desert island. And I wanna say that, you know, uh, my, my survival consultant for this was none other than David Halliday. Uh, Dave and his wife came out, uh, and uh, Jill, and, and uh, I don't think Matt Graham came out to this one. Matt, from that you guys would know from Dual Survival, uh, came out on the um, Sierra Nevada episode. I'm not sure if I've already done that director's commentary. Uh, but yeah, David Halliday. David Halliday is a legend. Uh, he, in, in, in this world of survival, he is the next generation right behind Larry Dean Olson uh, and, and people uh, of that ilk. These guys are legends. When you were learning survival in the 80s, these were like, whoa, you couldn't believe you just got to meet them sort of thing. And David Halliday was right in there with him. And so Dave came on this shoot. Obviously, he's not here now. But in the beginning, I went out there with uh, Dave and his wife and then my crew sort of thing. Uh, so if you ever want to train in survival, but especially desert survival, uh, then uh, David Halliday and Dave Westcott, too, uh, they're the way to go. Well, I'm shut down by high tide, gusty winds, can't get out to the boat, and the sun is ridiculously hot. So, three strikes, I'm out. All my efforts have to take place either in the morning or as the sun starts to drop down the sky. Otherwise, the heat stroke and dehydration that I risk is, is uh, too dangerous. I'm into my second day of survival on a desert island in Mexico, and there's no time like the present to find ways to better my situation. So some of you are all, uh, always ask, well, what are you drinking? Uh, this one is uh, Bullet, Bullet Bourbon. It's fine, fine whiskey. If I need some more, I'll go down. I think I got a bottle of Writer's Tears I want to finish off.
Sitting here getting antsy and thinking about things, and I think I just had an idea. There's a lot of junk on this beach. It's just rope and tin cans and plastic and bottles everywhere. Let's see if I can come up with a way to make water. With the right supplies, surviving on the edge of the ocean without fresh water is still possible. There are ways to create my own supply of drinking water. Wow, I didn't know I just got that last shot. Can we watch that shot again? Because that was cool. This is what you get when you take the time to walk a long ways and set up a camera. Let's see if I can just come up to get way this to make shot. water. I'm really, this is cool. With the right supplies, Forgot surviving on the edge of the ocean without fresh water is still possible. There are ways to create my own supply of drinking water. That was a cool shot. Come on, admit it. I'm only happy because I know the kind of effort I put into getting that shot was walking way far away, setting up the camera, pressing record, walking all the way back, turning around, walking all the way towards the camera. But a shot like that's pretty cool. Pays off. Let's see if I can make a water still. An active water still. Not one that's just dependent upon simple condensation. Let's see if I can make one utilizing the fire. There's all kinds of junk up in here. It was junk, now it's gonna be a useful tool for me. That's not rusted through. Sweet. Some of you know, by the way, that there's some dude that's been trying to trash me online saying that I faked everything. Uh, the guy's just a little, he's just a, Snotty little bear grills wannabe is what he is. Uh, and he's pointing out that, uh, um, oh, I just happened to find, I should wait until I do the Granada episode. I will, but it's about the lighter in the Granada episode. The point that I'm going to get to, and I'll, I'll go more into that when I get to the Granada episode, but is that there really is potentially not a beach in the world that doesn't have garbage on it. Plastic, metal, it's, it's really unfortunate. Uh, I love the stories when I see beaches getting cleaned up and so on, but you know, uh, and this beach was no exception. And so it was a matter of looking around. And uh, I, in my walking around, I had seen some things laying around. And that's when I was like, you know what? If I put all this together, uh, it's kind of like when, uh, when Captain Kirk has to make the, uh, the projectile, the, uh, the little bazooka that he makes when he's fighting the alien. And he starts thinking about all the different elements that would make the explosion. I was doing the same thing. I was walking the beach going, wait a minute. If I've got that plus that plus that plus that, I can, I can distill water. Hey everyone, allow me to interrupt myself. I don't really like hawking merchandise and swag, but you guys do ask all the time where you can get certain items. For example, check this out, Hennessy hammock. I put a lot of time and effort into designing this hammock with Hennessy. It's their top hammock. It's an amazing, beautiful, comfortable hammock to enjoy for all of your adventures out there. So just check it out. It's got a full size tarp, which is a big thing for me. It's got insulation. And I love it. So I've got the Hennessy hammocks. Of course, for years I've been in a phenomenal relationship with Hella of Norway, Hella knives. And this is our signature knife, of course, the Tamagami. These knives are handmade. In fact, I've been there to this very ancient factory where I don't know how long, how many, it's well over 100 years that they've been operating. And every single handle is handmade. All of the grinding, everything is done by hand and these knives are absolutely beautiful. I also now have a brand new relationship and you will see these items, new forging tools that I'm designing with LT Wright Knives out of Ohio. And also, Chef Paul Rogowski of Wild Harvest uh, has the signature Chef Paul Rogowski kitchen knife collection. Those are a big thrill to me to have these beautiful items that we spent years designing and I still have them available for you. However, if you want to go more the route of just enjoying the Survivor Man legacy, if you will, then of course, go to my website, lestow.ca, go to the shop page, right there you've got everything. All the swag, all the merch, such as my manual on survival. This is if you want to get into survival, this book is meant to be a way to walk you through step by step because I deal a lot more with concepts than I do with specifics because that's really important. Once you understand the concepts of fire by friction, uh, for example, you can do it depending on where you are because I can't give you the, the advice on how to do it here in Canada 
and hope that it's also going to work down in the jungle. Things are different. So I've always been very proud of this book, Survive. So that is my survival manual. Also, if you weren't aware, I've got the book, Will to Live. I wrote this book to, well, it was kind of for a lot of fun. I took my 10 favorite survival stories, such as Chris McCandles Into the Wild or The Robertson Family and The Life Raft, and I basically dissect them with this book. I, I, I tear apart the story, I go through everything, and I even give them a little bit of a grade on, and, on how I thought they did. So I really enjoyed writing this book. It's, it's a real easy read, it's a fast read, but I think there's a lot of insight there for you into all of these different examples of people who have either survived or perished. Speaking of books, so honored. So thrilled, so proud that Wild Outside, my first children's book, has won the Yellow Cedar Award, best nonfiction children's book in Canada for ages seven to 14. I tell stories from Survivor Man, lessons learned during those uh, expeditions and adventures, and there are even activities they can do in the out of doors. So there you go. My new book, my children's book, Wild Outside, Around the World with Survivor Man, has just won the Yellow Seed Award, and I'm up for another award yet. And in keeping with stuff that's going on right now, we are also up for an award for our season one recipe book from the series Wild Harvest. And if you've never caught the series Wild Harvest, check this out. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Up, hey there. Oh, go on. Now the job's getting fun. This dish is a showcase of how great these foraged ingredients come together. It's the best when it's its own flavor. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. Tell me that doesn't look awesome. Two seasons right now, 26 episodes. In the United States, it's on PBS stations. You can also get it on this YouTube channel. In Canada, Cottage Life TV. In Sweden and uh, Norway, on Matt Canelan. It's on National Geographic. Asia, which includes China and India. So my Wild Harvest series is playing around the world now. And we, with every single season, create a recipe book based on the recipes that we show you in the actual shows themselves. So that's Wild Harvest. And of course, if you want the DVD, you can get that on this website as well, lesjob.ca. And let's not forget too, that I'm a musician. The CDs themselves are available on the website. The next release will be the re-release of the Mother Earth album on vinyl. But Go on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to music, or on my website, you can go to the shop page, you can pick up all of my CDs. So this is the last one. This is my 20th anniversary selection. Check it out. Every film I've ever made, 76 films in all, all of the Survivor Man, Bigfoot, Beyond Survival, music documentaries, one-off films such as the award-winning La Lache about the school shooting up in Canada and a healing canoe trip. This is my 20th anniversary, uh, 76 films. And people that have picked this up have raved about it. And I'm really proud that I can say I've got 20 years of anything, to be honest with you. That's available for you as well on that Les Stroud shop page. Okay, that's me hawking my stuff. Back to the video. to create a little bit of a trough so I can feed the fire without having to lift off the bucket. Well, those tools that were in the sailboat have come in handy. In a situation like this, it's good to think like an engineer. Ooh, okay, so it's soft copper. I'm gonna try and get a bend in this thing. Ah. Yes, I'm trying to get a bend without crimping it. Should work actually. All right, that's a good sign. Now I'm gonna have to find a way to tighten a seal on this thing all around the edges. I might have to sacrifice something. The simplicity of distilling water is simply creating steam and somehow collecting it to drink. Just trying to make the seal a little tighter by putting that material in there. 
If you haven't caught on, what's going to happen here, or what I hope to happen, is I'm going to get a fire going underneath this bucket. The salt water will hopefully boil, come out through this pipe. The steam will hopefully cool. I'll have a cooling system down here. So I've got salt water in the jar. And uh, when this fills up with water, that should help to keep cooling the steam down. So fire down in here. Heats up the barrel. Comes out the pipe. Down into that bottle. Cool water down below. Helps to condense the steam. And hopefully, I get a drink of water. All right, and kudos to David Halliday. It was his suggestion. He said, is there any, like, if you can, look for something, look for some way of distilling water because showing how to distill ocean water would be a cool thing to show. I'm like, yeah, you're right. That would be pretty cool. And I don't think I've <coughs> really shown that, that all that much yet. <coughs> so, and I went looking and I found exactly what I needed. In the absence of cold, fresh water, condensed steam collected in a bottle and allowed to cool overnight will do in a pinch. And it may just mean the difference between survival or death from dehydration. I can go a long time without food, but it only takes a few days for the heat and dryness to devastate the human body. There was a first aid kit in the uh, sailboat, so I've got a piece of this cotton, and there was some toilet paper. But the way I'm going to make them last is I've got some lip balm. So I'm going to utilize this wax in both places. I'm going to put it on the, the cotton from the first aid kit and on the toilet paper. And that should really hold the flame one match fire you do not want to miss. It's got to take or I'm in trouble. Ah, the one match fire. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've done that on a couple of episodes. It's one of the things that I love to do when teaching people. Um, if you're taking a group out, especially a kids group or whatever, and they, you know, they're going to have to make a fire, but just give them one match. That's it. And having only one match really impresses upon you the importance of having all the tinder and kindling that you need all well in advance. You have to be perfectly prepared and set up if you have only one match. So getting a fire going when you only have one match is a fantastic survival practice method. I highly encourage you to try it. It can be intense when something so simple at any other time takes on such great importance now. This is my one and only match. All right, success. Somehow I've got to keep this fire going for about another eight straight days. Once I get a good base of coals going, I'll push some up underneath the, uh, the bucket of water and uh, hopefully get it boiling. It's only the second day, and even though I still have a small supply of drinking water from the boat, being proactive and working to make even more water is vital to surviving 10 days out here. Fire is always a good sight. Changes everything when it comes to survival. On my second night of survival, I can rest well knowing I'm not in danger of being swept out to sea in a disabled sailboat anymore should a storm come in. But as the coyotes howl, searching for a nightly meal themselves, the desert begins to cool in the night air and the ping pong effect of hot during the day and cold during the night continues to sap my energy reserves, making my need for food stronger. Aha, so right, we didn't show it. So you recall that in the beginning of this episode, I mentioned the supplies that I had, a cigar, there was a bottle of wine. I don't know if we will see the bottle of wine. Maybe I, maybe I should leave it be. But, because I'm not sure, if we see it, then I'll, then I'll want to comment on it then. But let's just say we, I'm not sure. But here's what I'll tell you, is that, uh, think about it. I've got no food in my stomach. And I've got a bottle of wine. So what I did was, I would have just a glass of wine. Now, I did tell the story. I filmed about how, you know, it's got nutrients and all the rest of it. And sometimes the editor, Barry Farrell, he made editorial decisions uh, and where he would say, you know, it just didn't work, you know, and more, more importantly, or just as importantly, uh, we had to make it all fit into 45 minutes. So we got seven days or five days, I suppose, in this case, to fit into 45 minutes. Tough. So Barry's a genius at, you know, 
cutting away the stuff that doesn't work. In fact, a little story on that. When Barry and I first started working together, uh, I'd say about 10 times over the course of a season, I'd say, hey, what about that scene with the bird and the thing? And he'd go, oh, yeah, no, it didn't work. And I'd go, well, can you show it to me? You know, and I would see the scene, and he's right, it wouldn't work. And after 10 times in a row, him say, telling me it didn't work, and me being convinced that it should work, uh, and then I watch it, I'm like, oh, yeah, crap, it doesn't work. I realized, you know what, and that's it. And that solidified a relationship uh, with director and editor where um, if Barry said a scene didn't work, I never questioned him again. When we would come together down, once everything was together, we'd look at it all and we would talk about what was working, what wasn't working, why it wasn't working and what it needed in order to work. And the best part was it was never about, well, we, we cause you, you know, you're not, you're not, it's not scripted and you can't go reshoot anything. So you had to work with what you had. So you had to kind of, you know, we had, we learned how to let the, the footage tell us what it wanted to do. And we just paid attention to that. And the, and the more we worked th together, the better and stronger it got. It doesn't matter how much I was in love with the scene, all the effort I put into filming the scene, how perfect it was for the story that I thought it should be in the, in the story. Uh, it would just be like, no, it didn't work. Barry said it didn't work. I do not need to see it again. And that is the magic of a relationship between a director and an editor. And I've said this before for all you filmmakers, and I know some, many of you don't believe me and don't agree with me, but if you do not edit your own films. Find a creative partner to edit your films. Same thing. Do not use padded music. Find a creative and talented musician to work with to score your work. All right. I'm, I'll jump off the soapbox now. On my third day of survival, I can start to get a handle on just how long and slow the tides are. And with that knowledge, I can look to times to get into the estuary to hunt for food. But as it is with all deserts, the window of opportunity to accomplish things out in the heat lies usually in the mornings and at dusk when the heat of the day is gone. There's danger and beauty in all corners of the earth. Which characteristic I choose to live within is entirely up to me. Survival depends upon my own choices. It wasn't so bad of a night. Got pretty cool, but I was able to... Uh... Keep the fire going. Fire. I'm just gonna interrupt myself. The shot just there we just watched of the, uh, of the seagull. Um, you know, you wanna uh, become good at, at filming wildlife. Uh, what I did when I was much younger is I would go to the dumps and I would film, you know, crows and ravens and vultures and even eagles uh, and uh, try filming a bird in flight. It's a wonderful way to get really comfortable with a tripod and a tripod head. You wanna have, you know, good quality equipment because you, you have to become very instinctual about where the bird is going to go next. It's really, really something to get into that, that sync, that vibe with the bird. And all of a sudden, you know which way it's going to turn by the way it flinches its shoulder. It's a great way to become very good with a camera filming wildlife is to film birds in flight. Still going nicely. Good bed of coals. Uh, I haven't got the water boiling yet to create steam. I fell asleep, and uh, so it died down enough that it just hasn't picked back up. Nice temperatures now, but it's going to get hot. This is not so much an estuary in the classic sense of the word, for there's no fresh water running into it on a steady basis. That really only happens here when rare storms come through. Yet it is a well-protected lagoon area and should serve as fertile hunting and fishing grounds. I know an estuary like this would be just filled with stingrays. So I want to protect my feet, and my calves, somehow from uh, getting stung. I've got to make something to protect me, and I think I know what I can grab off the boat to do that. As I paddle out, I'm watching down below to see if there are any signs of edible life. The water's much colder than it looks, and the only bounty I can see are the sea slugs, and they're all 15 to 20 feet down. Which, in hindsight, now, I would just free dive for them. But I really wasn't skilled at that then. Now I can free dive. So I learned how, um, and 15, 20 feet would be nothing. I'd go down 50 feet. Uh, and uh, I wish I'd known that, that then. There's something that comes up in this show that I, I love pointing out uh, because it really speaks to the reality of you being out of your comfort zone and caught in an unfamiliar situation. And... Uh, 
I didn't know how to free dive then. If I had, I could have gone down and gotten the sea slugs and fed on them. But there is something coming up. We'll see what happens. My old home. Well, that might be useful. Some old life jackets in this boat. Take them. Oh, that's right. This is one of, this is when, uh, right around the making of this episode uh, is when GoPros were invented, or at least when they came out on the market. Uh, so I've got the first version of GoPro uh, that I'm using here. And of course, it turns out the sound on them was awful at the time. But uh, as soon as they were available, I thought, oh, I can make use of this camera. As much as this sailboat is kind of romantic, I'm still happier on shore. I'm fortunate. I've got no issues with repurposing my belongings to aid in my survival. All too often, lost victims are weary of breaking or ripping apart something they own. It's like they feel guilty. Yet that guilt needs to be lost quickly if you expect to utilize your surroundings to the best of your advantage so that you can turn a possibly horrific ordeal into a manageable one. While the tide is low, the search for sustenance becomes easier as opportunities open up to me. And look at this. Oh, yeah. See this estuary here? Like it's just full of wildlife. There's all kinds of herons and cranes, egress. Yeah, it's just beautiful. The spots where some of the trees over there, loaded with birds at times, look over and there's just all sorts of white blobs in the distance. And it's all the birds hunting, fishing. There's a lot going on in this estuary. And I'm going to see if I can make some of it work in my favor. There's a patch over there of uh, drier sand, and that should be a better spot for clamming than in this more hard packed, wetter stuff. The tide here is gentle enough that it's gonna give me a lot of time to explore if I need to. If I remember correctly, I really had my hopes high on getting a bunch of food in this estuary. Memory serves, it didn't turn out so well, but let's see. I'm just gonna scoop along using this shell. See what I can come up with. Just start out from here. Hey, look at that. What did that take? 15 seconds? Clam. Okay, I guess I was wrong. I guess this was bountiful. Two clams. Three. Seven. Nice big one. Not bad, because I'm already getting to the point where I'm getting a meal. It's not all that often in a survival situation where you come across an opportunity to simply and easily gather more food energy than it takes to do the gathering in the first place. But I will tell you this much, if it is gonna happen, it's almost always on the ocean coastline. When the tide is out, the table is set. There is so much to gather on an ocean coastline. And if you haven't been watching my series Wild Harvest, you can see some of that. Yeah, the, there, I've got a series called Wild Harvest, Les Stroud's Wild Harvest. It's on PBS in the United States. It's on Cottage Life TV in Canada, Nat Ge National Geographic in Asia. Uh, but it's also on this YouTube channel, uh, as, long, uh, as well as tips, uh, foraging tips and cooking tips with Chef Paul Rogalski. you got to check out that series. If you have not, everybody who sees it is just falling in love with it. It's a very gentle, very cool and relaxing series called Wild Harvest. If you haven't seen it, it's on this channel. Go, into the, go to playlists. Uh, we will see playlists. What are you watching? I don't know where it's going to be. Up above me or down below me. Go to playlists, click on that, and find the Wild Harvest series. You'll love it. I guarantee you. It's a big field. It'll feed me for a while. It's counterproductive to walk a mile only to find enough food to fuel a half a mile. So walking 50 yards and gathering this easily is a lucky find. If you get a feel for it after a while, what I like to do is scoop like this and then drag my knuckles in behind. Sometimes my knuckles actually feel something that the shell didn't hit. Or when you hit bay dirt. Look at that. That's just a few minutes work, and I've got dinner. This is where I gotta start being careful in terms of stingrays. They're on their way back up from the south the warmer weather starts to return. And they come into these estuaries by the thousands, so it's not likely there's any in these little puddles, but they do get trapped. The tide comes in really flat, smooth, and even. 
and slowly and gently fills up these mangrove swamps. And that's why there's a lot that can be gathered here without having to go into deep water. The odd fish gets trapped. It'd be really nice to come upon a flounder or something like that. I will say when it comes to the stingrays, uh, when I was in the Amazon jungle, they considered a, a freshwater stingray sting one of the most painful things you could ever experience. And that's from people who live amongst the bullet ant. So yeah, freshwater stingray or sting, the smaller stingrays like that, excruciating pain. Well, I'm really fortunate to know that all these clams are here. I'll come back and gather clams as many as I can. But before I do too much in the actual water, I want to get some protection on my feet. One shot from a stingray and this whole venture is over with a very unglamorous ending. Three days surviving on a desert island. And as the tide slowly comes in, the water covers over all of my clam hunting areas and I'm finished for the day. Nature is forcing my hand so I'll take to the ocean side to see what else I can dig up. Uh, it's just time to go and gather some more firewood. There's so much wood all the way up and down this shoreline, it's easy. But I also see some seagulls messing around up, uh, up at the edge of the water here. I want to go find out what that's all about as well. Huh. Well, I think I see what the seagulls were all on about. That is what I think it is. Fortune may have just delivered me a meal. Whenever I spot lots of bird activity, I know something's up. And that's how I came across this little bit of food I can scavenge. Unfortunately for me, I'm not familiar with how to cook and eat squid, or even which parts are edible. And that's the trick of even finding or gathering wild edibles, whether something from the sea like this or wild plants. If I'm not sure what it is I'm eating or how to eat it, I can take a great chance at making myself very sick. And all too often, lost victims take the chance and eat something that kills them. So let's just touch on that for a second. People who are familiar with eating squid from the ocean knew exactly what to do with this. Turns out I could have just eaten the whole thing. But I don't know that. I've never caught a squid out in the ocean. I've never gotten fishing for it or been on the, you know, if I'm, if I'm in Lunenburg in Canada, I'm, I'm having lobster. You know, so uh, I just didn't know that. And that's something that, you know, you can't, criticize someone for if they're in a situation and they fail to take advantage of, you know, a fruit tree or wild edibles or meat or in this case a squid, you know, it's, they just didn't have that knowledge. They didn't have that familiarity. And for all my survival knowledge, I'd never come across a squid and caught a squid or eaten a squid. So I'm like, I don't know, is some of this thing poisonous? I, I don't know. I truly didn't know. And so it becomes a guess on my part. And unfortunately, that guess and erring on the side of caution meant I didn't eat all of what I could have eaten. But that is a stark reality for people in a survival situation. Now I got myself a meal. Ha, that's amazing. I've been walking this beach back and forth, back and forth, and I keep running into to sea slugs, but uh, nothing else. And then this, just hanging there. That's going to be good. Or it's gonna make well, same thing there. I don't know why I wouldn't have partaken of the sea slugs other than ignorance. You know, later on, uh, I'm, very, I'm very familiar with sea slugs. And I know how to grab them and, and, and how to catch them and how to cook them and to eat them. Uh, why didn't I do that? I just didn't know. And that not knowing didn't, that didn't worry my ego at all. That didn't worry my survival guruism or anything like this. You know what? That's the reality of the situation. I'm out of my, I'm out of my, 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 familiarity zone. You know, I'm not in Ontario, Canada right now. If we're in Ontario, Canada, I'll tell you exactly what you can eat. But this is Mexico ocean stuff, and I, I was never raised in the ocean. So the sea slugs and also not partaking of this entire squid, I just didn't know. Simple as that. Make me violently sick, one or the other. And I didn't have a crew beside me to tell me, oh, here, eat this. Happened to me in Alaska, and I came upon a spot where a, an eagle had just dropped a fresh caught salmon, and you can take advantage of that for a survival meal. Absolutely. I'm probably wasting more of this than I should, but I'm being honest here. I've never uh, done this before, never eaten one of these guys before, so I'm not taking any chances. I'm cutting off all the little grippers here. This is gonna be good. 
This gathered food from the lagoon and the ocean will go a long way in boosting my energy. I'm gonna make use of a few things I got from the boat. Cooking up this calamari. There's these forks, twist ties. Sweet. Uh, the heat of the day is pushing down on me now, but I'm still gonna go and cook this calamari while it's still fresh. It's so fresh that the uh, tentacles are actually still moving. Now we're talking squid. All right, I have no idea of knowing how much you're supposed to cook this. Like, honestly, this will be the first time I've ever eaten calamari in my life. Definitely tastes salty. Wow. All of a sudden, I just realized how hungry I am. I know what I'm doing for the rest of the day, eating squid. And then I've got clams for dessert. Under the desert sun, as my own supply of water depletes quickly, it becomes more and more important to be making as much water as possible. Now that I have food, my body needs even more water just for digestion. I don't know. Nah, it's a big thing, you know. The more food you eat, the more water you need. So sometimes rationing food when you have little water is a good thing to do because you fill yourself up with food but have no way of, of introducing water to help with digestion. You can put yourself in for a world of hurt. If you can hear this or not, but the kettle's boiling. With the bucket full of salt water, the steam is finally collecting in the cooling system I've made. Look at that. That's amazing. That's basically one day's worth of uh, distilling and whatever that is, 500 milliliters or so of liquid. And no salt. Yes, indeed. Mmm, that's amazing. That's really, really cool. I've always loved survival skills that keep working when you don't have to. Ah, uh, yes, like so many, like setting deadfalls and snares, they work when you don't have to. The other thing, too, about this is over time, you realize how you can make it even better and more efficient. That's a constant proactive survival tip is always be bettering your situation. Okay, so this worked. Great. Can I make it work more efficiently? That's important. That sun's going to drop fast like it always does, so before that happens, time for clam bake. I've actually returned uh, some of the smaller ones back to the estuary. There's no reason to be greedy here, and it's better for their population to not just go in and just clear them out. So I've kept only the big ones and thrown all the little tiny ones back. The young ones, let give them a chance to grow. It's real simple. All I have to do is put them on the coals. Best way to do this is take it and just put this uh, the hinge end down into the coals, and then they'll open up at the top. And in the meantime, I can chew on some squid. This particular feast offers little in the way of carbohydrates or sugars. It's all protein. There we go. Oh, that's really good. That is really good. Sun's going down pretty quickly. I've got clams. Got my squid. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's good. Mm. Now, if only there were coconuts on this island. I'm getting hungry just watching this. Um, gosh, yeah. Ocean gathering. You want to get into wild harvesting? Ocean gathering. Go learn from an expert. It is so rewarding and so much fun. Uh, but learn the proper ways, learn how to do it in a way that helps the species itself that you're harvesting to thrive. That would be a big score. For now, life and survival has taken a positive turn, and it's easy for a moment to get rested and prepared for the inevitable search for life-sustaining fresh water. I do remember that the stars, the nights were 
epic, just massive star fields. It's been four days of survival, and to get myself into the deep waters of the lagoon to hunt for more food, I'll have to take chances with the stingrays. They come in here by the thousands, so a little homemade protection can't hurt. Well, that looks good. If I were to do something like this, my feet are going to sink into the mud as I walk, so something around my foot itself might be kind of useless. This could appear to be a little overkill, but an injury, any injury, while in a survival situation, can change things for the worse, and all it takes is the wrong step in the wrong place. That's not bad, actually. So if I'm walking and I'm testing, if a stingray does shoot up and, and hits me in the calf, at least I'm protected there. Surviving alone is one thing. Surviving alone and injured is quite something else. Stingray shin pads. I was gonna say, it's kinda like hockey equipment. First time in a long while, a lot of clouds coming in. I'm pretty protected from the uh, sun, semi-protected from the wind, but we'll see how I am for the rain. All right, let's go spear fishing. So I've got a spear, the one that I made, plus a cane pole, just so I can test the deeper waters for stingrays. There should be no shortage of available bounty here. I'd expect that in a mangrove lagoon like this. Some places just seem like they should be obvious fertile hunting or gathering grounds. But the wilderness is neutral. It neither adds nor detracts from survival. I'm always in the position of having to go with the flow of the seasons, live by the weather. Even population movements of game are a deciding factor. These elements and more determine whether or not I'm in the right place at the right time for an easy or difficult go at surviving. Any fish that are coming in and out of the estuary are gonna come right along this path. Water's very cold, a lot colder than I thought it was. Hard part is uh, just being able to see into the water, the ripples, just looking for anything. Crabs, maybe a flounder going by. This is incredibly disappointing. I was hoping to find some deep channels where fish could be trapped. Even at low tide, there's just too much water here. So I'm just up into the back corner of this estuary. Nothing here. I was hoping to find some more pools of water where fish might be trapped, but nothing. Everything's a little too shallow. What I am able to find are these oysters attached to the rocks and the roots of the mangroves. After a day of hunting, they'll have to do as my only catch of the day. It's actually really easy to get them off the roots. Easier than when you're trying to get them off rocks. At least I know these are here. They're not going anywhere. Like the clams, these oysters are going to be high in salt. Pretty much the worst thing for me to intake with dwindling water reserves. But for now, I'll take in the nutrition to help keep my energy up so that I can continue to survive and even thrive. There we go. Well, that was worth the effort. Cheers. Mmm, that's delicious. All right, well, there's hundreds of these little oysters all attached to the roots of the mangrove. This is good. I've got clams and oysters now that I can gather from the estuary. The seawater slowly makes its way back into the lagoon, and I lose my easy hunting grounds. You know, and, and, and in hindsight, looking at this, like if you were just staying still and that was it, I would just constantly, I would just go after hundreds of clams and oysters and probably live pretty good when it comes to food. Of course, then again, there's no fresh water here. And that, I believe, is what ends up becoming the problem. I'm just uh, clearing away some of this skin. I cut one off a little while ago and it seems to be doing better. This one here is still looking bad. I'm gonna need these blisters to be healed up. I'm not gonna be able to walk in these boots. So hopefully the salt, the sun, will uh, heal these up and I'll be back on my feet again and able to get out of here. I'm going to gather a bit, a bit of food, I'm making a bit of water. The waves are rough, they're holding me in. It's not like I can get out in the ocean right now. And uh, you just start to kind of 
go inside yourself in a situation like this. No matter what anybody tells you, no matter what TV you watch, the reality is that solo survival is a, is a lonely experience. It's said that any army marches on its stomachs, and it's no different for survival. Stomach problems can knock you out of the game quickly. Oh man, I don't know what those oysters did to me. But they're not sitting in my stomach very well. In a survival situation, there's two things that knock you down really quickly. Shot feet and a rot gut. And right now, I've got both. You know, I know I, I, I started off by saying that, 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 you know, I was emotionally struggling when I went to film this particular show, but I got to say, I haven't seen this in so many years. I'm really enjoying it. I forgot about the clams. I forgot about the oysters. I forgot about, no, I didn't forget about the squid. Uh, just so many cool factors to this. And this right now, me feeling sick, this is, this is Barry Farrell at his best as an editor saying, okay, Stroud's going through a sickness and he left the cameras rolling. What can I do with it? And I'll just, I'll just back it up a little bit here so we can watch this scene again. Knock you down really quickly. Shot feet and a rot gut. And right now I've got both. This is very similar to my time in Kalahari in the Jeep. I just knew as a storyteller that, you know, I have no energy here. I am, I'm about to get into some pain here. All right, just press record and put the camera up and let it do what it's gonna do. And that, those moments, Barry Farrell, the editor, really enjoyed because in the end, they created a scene for you to watch like no other. You didn't see this in dual survival, you know. You didn't see this in man versus wild, unless they were manufactured and they were phony and fake as hell. This was real stuff that I was going through, the Kalahari heat stroke, going down the mountainside in Norway. I forgot that I got sick in Mexico. And these scenes gave my editor, Barry Farrell, an opportunity to mess with them and to do something a little bit more beyond the TV that everybody had been watching. And... Uh, I always found it very powerful. In the course of survival, stomach problems leading to vomiting when already dehydrated can be deadly. Uh, I'm just trying not to throw up right now. I don't think I'll be eating any more of those oysters. This is the true hardcore reality of survival. Hours and hours and hours and even days just existing. Boredom's a killer on a time like this. But I don't have any other choice. I'll wait this out and hope that I don't throw up. I gotta say that, you know, when it comes to, you know, stomach illness, it's probably the worst thing there is for a survival situation. Uh, and I mean, you know what happens when you get sick and you're sick from stomach illness or food poisoning. You just want to die. It's just like, you know what? Just take me now. I, I just, I can't do this any longer. You know, uh, um, if so many times I got food poisoning from my travels around the world, uh, curled up in the fetal position in some hotel room somewhere, naked at the base of a toilet. Ah, oh, not pretty. And you just want to die. And so now, add to that being out in a survival situation, 
no toilet, no fresh rotting water, no medication, nobody to rub your back or bring you a little piece of toast and peanut butter and pat your head. You know, you, you don't get away with man colds when you're out in the wilderness on a survival expedition. Part of the day due to stomach problems, but at least the heat of the desert is broken by the setting sun and I get a small break. But losing time in a survival situation is never good and always frustrating. It's been five days of survival in the desert where the nights are cold and the days are hot. But the Mangrove Lagoon area has proven to be a great location for gathering food. Finding fresh water is a bigger problem on the ocean's edge and dehydration comes quickly. The heat and the wind constantly pull the moisture out of my body through convection. So finding a way to replenish that water is vital to survival. All right, so let me tell you my story now about the wine. So I had said in the beginning, and, and I remember, I think, I think we, the thought was, oh, well, let's even just take it out of the intro because we're not going to show it anywhere in the show. It didn't really look very good, so we're just going to keep it out. So don't even put it in in the intro. And I said, no, there's no way. I had it with me. I want to at least say it. So I've said it and mentioned it in the show. You guys recall many other stories. If you want to go and watch some of my other director's commentaries, you'll recall some of those other stories where, um, like Utah and so on, where the network or my production partners were trying to push me to say something or do something, and I, re I refused. And I relented once or twice, and I regretted it. And this was at a place where there was no, I wasn't going to relent to anybody. I was in control. And uh, so I said, no, we still have to show or show that I say, and I had a bottle of wine, because I did. End of story, because I did. Now, it didn't make it into the show, because Barry Farrell, in his wisdom, as an, as an editor, I trusted him, he was right. It didn't look good. It wasn't as good as any of the other scenes. Basic, that was basically it. It looked good, but it wasn't as good as the other scenes, and we only had 45 minutes. Something's got to go. And he said, look, do you, if, you know, I'd like to not bother putting in you having a drink of wine every night. Uh, um, it doesn't look like anything special, and there's so many other cool things that we're teaching and showing in the episode. So I said, fine, okay, I've said it. We're leaving that part in, great. Here's what you didn't get to see. Here's what actually happened. Every single night, I had, so I had a bottle of white wine, and every night I would have like this much, okay? Hardly any or no food in me. So every night of what you just watched, I went to bed drunk. I was like, I'd have that one glass, I'd be like, and I'm, I mean, I can handle my liquor, but oh my gosh, when, you got, when you're out there, you're dehydrated, you have no food, and then you have a glass of wine, I was looped every night. But here was the advantage of that. It was an interesting survival advantage. I slept like a baby every single night. I had that glass of wine or that chug of wine, a couple of chugs, right? And then I was like, <sniffs> I was out. So interesting. It's an interesting technique to say, well, you know, I shot a liquor before bed in a tough situation like that or a glass of wine or whatever, and you sleep. Now, what's, what's the thing? What's the deal there? Well, remember... Sleeping in a survival situation is so vital, so important. I harp on it all the time. You've got to get your sleep or you could perish. Well, all right. That was a great way to do it. So yeah, every night I was like watching the stars and I was just looped. I'm like, ah, oh, this is so beautiful. Ah, oh, I like Mexico. <laughs> Out till morning, <laughs> every single night. And then I guess I had finished it by around this fifth day. Uh, I had finished it. It only took a glass or like a couple of chugs uh, to, uh, to get like that. But anyway, that was something that never got shown in this episode that um, I kind of wanted to. I, I think I always knew, you know, one day I'm going to tell that. I'm going to tell that as a behind the scenes story. So that's why you heard it in the first scene and you never saw the, the wine again. Barry was right. It didn't really work into the, so many of the other things were much cooler. Uh, but that is what happened with the wine. Pretty funny, eh? slice it. It gets cold here at night. There's a strong wind still coming in off the ocean and uh, blows on me here all night long, which means I have to spend uh, most of the night just stoking the fire. The sun's just coming up now. In fact, because of drinking the wine, the fire almost went out on me. 
I was sleeping so well. I woke up and there's just like a few coals. I'm like, ah, I had to get the fire going again. And hopefully, actually, I think if I stand up, I'll be in the sun. Yeah, there it is. It's on the feather. Once the sun hits, it's a world of difference. It takes a chill right out of your bones. You spend the last two hours of any night just, just staring at that horizon going, come on, sun, come on. And it's going to go from cold to very hot very soon. So long as my energy is still good, there's no point in not looking for more opportunities to aid in survival. It's always important to know what's just around the corner. I'm going to take a long walk along the beach, see if I can come across any other squid or something else that might be edible that might have washed up. Probably do this every morning, you never know. The coyotes sure have a run along this beach. Every night I hear them yipping and yelping. And they're obviously coming in real close to me. Not close enough for me to see yet, but I know they're here. Way up ahead of me on the beach, I can see a couple of coyotes running down at some of the shorebirds. I haven't been this far down the beach before. Yeah, that's coyote for sure. Yeah, he was watching me, let me get in real close. And let's, let, there he is. Let's do a little quick chat on that. Maybe because uh, I've had some bourbon. Uh, I'm going to a sort of a, I won't rant, personal pet peeve. I don't know what you want to call it. How about reality? Look, guys, the reality is uh, there is so much unwarranted fear of black bears, coyotes, wolves, cougars. I hear it in my, here in my neighborhood, you know, some, in, in, here in Ontario, someone go, oh, we saw a bear on the trail. Like, and, and not to be condescending, but half the time I want to go, uh, duh, yeah, it's like central Ontario. There's 60,000 plus bears in Ontario. There's lots of bears around here. But people freak out when they see or hear about a bear in their neighborhood. Uh, I mean, close to Toronto, there are deer and coyote and black bear that go into the, the Don Valley, close to New York, close to every major city. And the thing about dealing with wild animals is getting a sense of confidence, research them a little bit, understand how to be around them. You can be around grizzly bears, you can be around black bears, coyotes, wolves, very, very safely. And the stories from history, there are, there, there are hardly none. Uh, in fact, in fact, let me go a little further here, probably be again because I had a glass of bourbon, but you know, I heard recently there was a thing on with uh, Joe Rogan and, and, he, and one of his buddies who's like a big game hunter and they were going on and on about how dangerous man eating these wolves are. What a bunch of freaking bullshit, okay? The wolves are not man eaters and they're not out to hunt down children sort of thing. I, I even had a friend who told me he was he was out in Oregon hiking in the hills and he came upon three guys dressed in camo, armed to the teeth with all kinds of guns. What were they out doing? All around hunting cougar. Yeah, because they're banding together and they're killing people. What a bunch of dumbass bullshit. Okay, so nature like coyotes and cougars, predators, secondary predators, coyotes, cougars, black bears, um, these Creatures want nothing to do with us. And if you have a sense of confidence when you are out there, if you ask me to go out on my little two-mile trail that I have out in the woods right now where I know there are lots of black bear, I know there are cougars, and you say, can you just walk the trail, just you alone, maybe a little flashlight so you can see where you're walking, I'd have no problem doing that. Because I'm a hero, because I'm cool? Uh, no, not at all, because I know that it's safe. Uh, and that's the situation. Or people would see something like this image of this coyote and just get all freaked out. You know, coyotes shouldn't be at the population level they're at, but they are because we wiped out the wolves, or at least the Americans in the lower 48 wiped out the wolves. Uh, and so the wolves don't keep the coyotes in check. And then the coyotes breed with dogs, and you do get strange breeds, and you do get dangerous packs. But for the most part, guys, sorry, I'm, I know I'm ranting now because it's, it's something that has bugged me for a long time. There is nothing special about me and my time in nature and my understanding of wild animals other than I've done my research. Read Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidances by Stephen Herrero. Read that book if you're worried about being in bear country. Know that these creatures are, yes, I know it's a cliche. They're more afraid of you than you, are, than you should be of them. I've been face to face with a cougar. Now, I'm not saying cougars aren't powerful. I know they can take down a horse. I know they're very powerful creatures and I know the odd one has attacked. 
but compared to the percentage of time of human hours spent in cougar territory, it's minuscule. You stand a far greater chance every day getting in your car and driving or walking the streets, a far, far greater chance of dying and being injured than you ever do from a coyote or a cougar or a wolf or a black bear or even a grizzly bear. Polar bears, different story. That's another subject matter. But the ones that I just mentioned, yeah, you, you, you are taking far more chances every single day getting in your car than you ever are if you walk out on a trail and know that there are black bears in the area. Okay, rant over. Let's watch this coyote. I feel like dances with wolves here. Dances with coyotes. There's a big pole sticking up, up here. I'm gonna check this area out. A little mini village set up. There's that coyote. He's curious. See if that brings him back. Little villages like this one are usually set up nowadays by the military to try. And so my point there is, anytime you have any kind of interaction with a, a wolf or a bear or a deer or a moose or an elk or a coyote, it's pretty special. I've told the story in keynotes and in public appearances about my time with uh, meeting a lynx. And if you want your, ch oh, nice segue, Les. If you want your children to know that story, I've got my children's book, Wild Outside, has won four. It's been up for four national awards. It's won three of them, and I'm runner-up for the fourth one or something like that. I uh, really loved writing that book, and I tell the story about meeting the lynx as well as being chased up a tree by a moose. Now, a moose in the rutting season, that's an animal to be worried about. Or a cow moose with a calf, that's an animal to be worried about. Not a black bear, not a cougar to stop drug smugglers from moving up and down the coast. They stay out here and keep their chase boat hidden, ready to rush out and apprehend smugglers out on the ocean. And this is the whole trick to survival. If you can be proactive, if you can move around, if you can check out where you are or what's around you, you never know what you're gonna find. You stay put and wait and wait, and you're not sure if rescue's gonna come. You don't know what might be right around the corner. Sometimes it could be a cabin. Sometimes it can be food, sometimes it can be rescue. So just even doing this walk along the beach reveals new things to me. Things I can make use of for survival if I need to. While walking back to my beach shelter, I see that the boat has slipped off its anchor. It's being blown into the shore and destroyed slowly as wave after wave digs the keel into the sand bottom. Okay, this boat's in rough shape now. Let's see if I can get the keel to come up. Yeah, I can't get the keel to come up. I'm trying. But I don't think that's doing anything. It's probably snapped off and broken. And now it's stuck in the sand here. This sailboat's definitely seen better days. It's done. That's too bad. I'm getting out of here. That's a done deal. In a true survival situation, the loss of the boat would spell disaster. I had other plans to move inland and find fresh water, so it doesn't matter so much in the short term. But in the long term, it's devastating. After five days in Mexico, it's time to start thinking about moving on and finding a greater source of fresh drinking water. The small amounts I can make with my water still are not keeping up with my body's demands in the dry desert heat. If I can, I'm gonna try and take as much shelter material with me, but it's a lot to carry. And I don't wanna make this be turned into two trips. My body needs fresh water, so my motivation for moving on is at its highest. Where I'm going is still along the shore. It's a long walk, but it's along the shore, so I can, I'm gonna drag it, and hopefully uh, it's, I don't think it should be too heavy. I'll put all the camera gear on my back, in my backpack, 
as uh, usual. Be a bit of walking today, but it'll get me to a new location, new opportunities, new ways to survive. To keep it simple for now, I'm just going to move myself down the shoreline to the little village I found and use that as a break point. I do remember that this walk was going to be daunting. It's just like, oh, it's going to be such a long walk to get into those mountains. But I wanted to create a different scenario for you. The second five days, okay, let's go deeper in. And, and uh, it's not that some, somebody wouldn't do this. Somebody would do this because, again, it's the, the ever-present need for fresh water. I'm moving on to see just what I can find inland, but most importantly, to find a more reliable source of drinking water. This looks like my new home. I'm going to make camp at a small abandoned village built in the style of the Siri Indians by the military as a place for scouting drug runners. Throughout these areas, the Siri Indians created these small, airy villages and places of food gathering. I got the long walk back to go grab the uh, fire log and bring it here. Back along the beach at my first shelter location, along with items I can't carry forward, I've left my only fire going so that I can retrieve a burning log and bring my fire forward. A necessary job since I have no matches or lighter. Still going. I still have five more days to survive in the heat of the Mexican desert. I think that's kind of almost an underrated, understated thing about survival is carrying fire. Because if you can carry fire and you can save your matches, your lighter fluid, what have you, uh, then it's just a better way to do it. Uh, and this was actually a very cool episode to show this. First of all, grabbing the lodge and going now, but also uh, the log and going now, but also knowing how I carry the fire coming up in the second part of Mexico 10 Days. I'm just going to shift over here. There's another shelter here and their old fire pit. So I have a feeling it's here for a reason. Ah, the wind is just, as you can see, picked up intensely. I mean, it's even blowing seaweed across the beach now. Wind like this works in a convection sense. It just sucks the moisture right out of your body constantly. That's why it's better for me to keep this shirt on, even if I'm a bit hot, to stop the wind from constantly sucking moisture out of my body. As it is, I can feel some of the symptoms of dehydration now. I certainly haven't urinated in an awfully long time. I gotta search for water. Survival is almost always centered around the ever-present need for fresh drinking water. In the desert and at the ocean's edge, the need is amplified by the heat and dry winds. You know, in hindsight, what I should have done, though, I really should have gathered a bunch of clams to take with me. I don't know why, I mean, I had so much to do, I suppose, and a long way to travel and all the gear to ca carry, but, but in a survival situation, my advice, my critique of my own self right now would be get, you know, 30, 40 clams to take with you uh, to eat those. Now, I also might have been a bit gun-shy because of the, the I, I lost a half a day to an upset stomach, um, and I know I blamed it on the oysters, but maybe it was the clams. You know, I hear so much of this nonsense about fighting against nature, you know, man versus the wild sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, it really is nonsense. The wilderness just is. It's not against me, it's not for me. It's here, it's benign, it just is what it is. And right now, it's windy. I went around and liberated some more rope from the camp. And I got to thinking about my sleeping arrangements and how I can make them better. The advantage of taking the sail from the boat is paying off huge now. Okay, you can see this is gonna take a while, so lead me to it, and I'll show you what I've got when I'm done. And this comes from years of, oh, hang on, Luke, battery died. Okay, sorry, battery died, but I think we're okay now. This is one of those times where a little bit of simple acquired skill sets, like how to sew, can really pay off in a survival situation. 
So this comes from years of doing things like making uh, my own moccasins or my own winter mitts. Uh, some simple, simple techniques. Hey, even Neil Pert learned how to knit. I think I did it. Made myself, essentially, a bivy sack. <laughs> Look at that. That's gonna work. Sweet. I've carried with me a small supply of fresh clams dug out of the sand at my last shelter location. Time to chow down on clam. Oh, Maybe that's good. where the name clam chowder came from. I probably shouldn't be eating because it's lack of water, but I'm hungry. And the clams are the one thing that's easy and plentiful. Clams are also salty, increasing my need for more fresh water. And it was good. This should be a lot better than last night. This bivy sack I've made out of the sail with the blanket, it already feels uh, more comfortable. I've got the fire burning in behind me, which is great. I can feel heat from here and I can stoke it all night long. So this is uh, making circumstances a little better. Most of my survival needs have been met. Fire, shelter, sleeping bag, and even food. So now it comes down to the most important need of all, water. I was thinking that on first sunlight, I would get up and uh, make my move into, uh, into the hills. And then I realized that, well, I'm gonna need more food. I'm gonna take food in with me just in case there's nothing in there. Uh, I don't know what I'll find once I get in there. Tide is just going down nicely right now. So it makes walking easy. I'm gonna walk back to the estuary, check the ocean along the way for anything that might have uh, come in overnight, any more squid. It'll also give me one more day for these uh, blisters to heal, because they're still not so good. Sometimes in survival, I find myself in the center of a competition for food sources, water, and even shelter. Looks like my Dances with Coyotes has returned. Just hunting the shoreline looking for a meal, just like me. Survival for the coyote in a desert place like this mirrors my own. We both just want the same things. Food, water, and shelter. As always in a survival situation, the land is the grocery store. So I'm heading back to the grocery store. There's no harm in checking out these tide pools close to camp. You never know what you're gonna find unless you go exploring. Nice. There's another food source here. This guy right here. Called limpets. There we go. There he is. This guy is a tasty morsel, and I don't have to bother cooking him either. Just basically liberate him. And eat. Mmm. Like everything here, salty. But that's really delicate and juicy and good. There's a bunch more limpets here, so I can pick them and eat them as they come. Yeah, that's a nice big one. Ouch. Bonus. All right, so I've got another source of food here. I'll just scour along these shores, eating as many of these limpets as I can. There's also a lot of rock oysters here, but the way they uh, treated my stomach yesterday, I'll hold off on the oysters. I don't want a chance of getting sick like that again. This should be a really good spot for collecting scallops. Well, sadly, you can see why there's no scallops left on the other side. I searched in vain to see if I could find some scallops to eat. It was a good, good area for it. But uh, because this place has been habitated by people before, they fished it out. So it happens when you don't leave behind a population to regenerate. You leave nothing behind. 
Leaving something behind for the future is what makes survival possible. So while I was out clamming, I went back to my old survival site and I grabbed the uh, water still. Thought I'd put it back in action. It can make me up to a pint a day. It's been working really well. It's exactly the same as I had it set up before. Got the uh, fire underneath. It's filled with uh, ocean water. Steam comes out the top. Fresh water steam and drops into my bottle. So I want to get a couple more pints before I uh, head into the hills there. I also gathered a ton of clams, so I should be okay for a little bit. Uh, I didn't realize actually that I'd done that. Okay, that's cool. Uh, a couple of days anyway in terms of food. Last thing is just these blisters on my heels. Waiting out one more day here, I'll give them just a chance to just get a little bit more healed over, hopefully. And uh, so I'm gonna stay here tonight and uh, head in tomorrow. My movements, every movement, is usually dictated by the weather or the time of day. I want to make my move here during the cooler morning hours before the sun becomes intense overhead, making travel arduous. Water, or at least the need for it, is my motivation. Reward. There we go. Reward. Did this once before, about <laughs> 10 years ago. The very first Survivor Man adventure, ordeal, survival situation, whatever you want to call it, that I went on. I'm going to do it again. Here goes nothing. The offshore wind will take that bottle very far. Nope, is the answer to your question. I have never had any, well, I had somebody contact me from Florida saying they found my bottle and I said, oh, okay, let's get together. And then they never responded back. So I don't know if it was a joke or someone was just trying to reach out to me kind of thing and say they talked to me sort of, sort of thing. But um, otherwise, no, the two bottles, the one dro uh, dropped out in Belize and uh, I think it was Belize and this one here, Mexico, I've never heard back. Hours into the day, my water still has plenty of time to do its job and provide me with a small bit of fresh drinking water. Well, it's working again. Check it out. Yes, indeed. That's great. Perfectly distilled water. There's some copper flakes in there, but oh, that's all right. I'll take those. The water I've made is indeed a great help but it's no longer enough. If I don't make a move, I'll start to slowly dehydrate. I've collected some more clams to give me nutrition and a small bit of energy. I've also grabbed a few pieces of beach junk, a tin bottle, and some plastic bottles for my travel kit. So with some rest, I can make my way into the hills tomorrow. Well, the winds are still howling. That's it for another day out here. This is day six, I think. I'm heading into day seven and uh, I hope the winds abate throughout the night. I'm gonna crawl into my bivy sack. I'll let the water still keep working throughout the night. It's making me good water. And then I'm gonna head into the valley, into the rocks, where I know there's drinking water, there's springs. I don't know if there's any food though. That's gonna be the tough part. Into the land of the coyotes. Ah, oh, it was a cold night. I know it's hard to imagine a place that can be so hot during the day and cooling down to be so cold at night, but a desert is that kind of place. And uh, I'll tell you, if it gets any colder than it did last night, I'll be waking up to frost. Well, the good news is that since it is so cool this morning, it gives me some sort of more refreshing strength to get up and uh, pack up my bivy sack and my, my camera gear and head into the hills before it gets uh, too hot, before that sun gets too high overhead. It's time to move on. It may be only a day's trek into the mountains and rocky hills, but under the heat of the sun, it's still enough to tax my energy reserves significantly, especially when you consider how little food I've had for six days now. If I don't find water, it'll all be for nothing. I was almost getting ready to leave, and I was trying to think, OK, how am I going to carry the fire now? I've got no more matches, so how do I get the fire into where I've got to go? Now, hang on a second. I still have, from when I was on the sailboat, 
three of these babies left. Instant fire I really like doing this. The fact that I could show that a cigar is also an excellent fire carrier was just, it was fun for me as a survival instructor to say, hey, just think outside the box, man. Carrier, I've got two more of these cigars and I'm sure if I just sort of hold them and let the wind work on them with any luck at all, that'll last me through to uh, wherever it is I end up tonight. And that takes care of the first leg of the journey. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay, I've got the pack full of my camera gear, the bivy sack on it, uh, I've got clams, and there's tons of these water bottles and pop bottles around here, plastic. So I filled up as much water as I could. I think I got another day, maybe. Here we go. All right. There's something important right now. Oh, there's yeah. something bothering me just on the bottom side of my foot. It's always critical in a long hike to uh, get rid of any hot spots or anything that's going to bother your feet as you go or it just can wreak havoc later. You know the old saying, that's not the desert that'll stop you. It's the grain of sand in your shoe. And I'll give that saying up to a guy named David Arama, who was one of my early instructors in learning survival. And that was actually uh, something he would always repeat in class. It's not the desert that'll stop you. It's the grain of sand in your shoe. Days into surviving on a desert island off the coast of Mexico, my search has turned to primarily finding water. There was plenty of food to gather on the ocean coast, but my trek will take me inland now, where I hope to find small pockets of rainwater caught in the smooth rocks of the desert. That's the first little score in the desert here. These are goji berries, and definitely edible. Pay a lot for these back in uh, Canada. Oh yeah, these are excellent. It's the first real fresh food I've had in a long time. So I'm gonna take advantage of this. Eat them all. <laughs> all right, now this little plant here would have been good to have had early on my week because it's, uh, it's a healing plant. And uh, a poultice of this or um, if I were to put this in boiling water and, and steep it and just steep it for a long time, uh, even just hot water, and then put my foot in that, it would have been extremely healing for my blisters. It's been nicknamed uh, governess. I think I'll scoop some up with me now just in case. And I think I'm gonna stop it right there because I believe that I'm watching the cut that's part of the 20, 20th anniversary collection that you can get. Show that, show that uh, up on the screen there, Luke. You can get this 20th, 20th anniversary of all of my films, 76 films over 20 years of filmmaking. And this is Mexico uh, 10 days, but what I've done is, I think we chunked it, the two episodes together into one film that we're, I'm watching right now. But rather than keep you on the hook for this, what I'll do is I'm gonna stop it here, and then uh, I will pick it up, and i probably be next week that you'll see um, the second half of this when I go off into the hills. At least I'm pretty sure that's what we've done here. Yeah, that's what we did for the 20th anniversary. You get the whole film all together. So instead of chopping in two like we did for television, you get the all 10 days together. But you're going to see the second half of the director's commentary when I come back at you. So thanks a lot. Um, I, got nothing else, I, got, I got nothing else to say. So I'll talk to you soon. We'll see you on part two of the Mexico 10 days director's commentary. Oh, hey, actually, before uh, Luke shuts us out, know that in the scenes that are coming up, the second half of the Mexico journey, there was a whole situation there that played into me in a spiritual sense. And I will tell you about that when you see part two of Mexico, director's commentary.